And the big question that we're gathered here today to learn about and answer is, what is City? <laughs> How do cities work? What's the story there? Um, so this is the city of Berkeley. I uh, am curious, actually, a few of you mentioned, but do we have a sense of how many of us on the call are Berkeley residents? I know we, we also have Albany and Emeryville in the uh, the org, but uh, I'm seeing some hands go up. Cool, 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 cool. Berkeley. Um, yeah, no Albany or Emeryville today. Really? Oh, well, hey, all right. What's up, Berkeleyans? Uh, so you, you know this map well, um, but what you might be a tiny little bit less familiar with is these kind of color-coded chunks right here. So in the city of Berkeley, we have eight city council districts. And the one that I represent is this one right here, the big seven, which encompasses the UC Berkeley campus, Southside neighborhood, and all along the Telegraph Avenue commercial district. Each one of these districts is approximately equal in size. Obviously not by, by square footage or acreage, but by population. They're roughly all around 15,000 people. And so what you'll notice, especially when you consider that the campus footprint of UC Berkeley doesn't have any residents on it, uh, unless the chancellor, whoever that is at any given moment, is, is living in the chancellor's mansion, um, it's really just this stretch right here, this kind of rectangular block around South Side, and then the tentacle that reaches down Telegraph here. Uh, and that's because it is by far the densest districts in the entire city. A lot of this is student dormitories, uh, you know, frat row along Piedmont right here, much of it dense, multifamily, some of it mid-rise apartment buildings. Um, what's especially interesting about this is that, you know, the city of Berkeley is only about 120, almost 130,000 people, and we have eight city council districts in addition to a citywide elected mayor. That's actually more than really almost any other city our size. A lot of cities, even much bigger than us, have, say, five city council members and a rotating mayor. Uh, so every two years, maybe two or three of them will be up for re-election, and they just pass the baton of the mayorship uh, all around the council, like, like taking turns, you know, which works out in a certain sense. But in Berkeley, we have such rich localized politics to every one of the different neighborhoods in the city. Uh, it was a really big deal when a few decades ago they decided they wanted to move to a district election system. And what that means is you actually have you know, council members who, who really are spending all of their time focusing on the unique neighborhood issues of every district. The concerns of folks that you know, live aboard, it's people who live on boats at the marina have, are very distinct from people who live in the the hills of District 8 or District 6 that right now are, are very concerned, especially about wildfire risk and the, the urban wildlet interface. So it's, it's a nice system and it, it tends to work out all right. But there's a pretty rich history in particular to how the shape of District 7 that I represent now came to be. Years ago, um, long before I was in office or really you know, on the radar in Berkeley at all, uh, students ran a campaign to redraw the lines of District 7 to create the first student supermajority district in the entire country. So this is a bunch of folks uh, on the steps of City Hall presenting one of the various plans. There are always competing maps uh, for redistricting proposals to make sure that District 7 was as student-centric as possible with the idea that you know, in a city where students make up as much as you know, a quarter of the population of the city, probably more, that they should have a voice of their own in the decisions happening in City Hall. Knowing that especially because UC Berkeley houses so few of their students in dormitories, the vast majority of the student body is actually living off campus in private apartment buildings, private homes, private ADUs. And that means the vast majority of students are subject to the city's housing laws and subject to the whims of development patterns that are really in the city's control, not the campuses. And many years later, I came into the picture. This is me at one of our, our student government meetings on campus. I got involved with the, uh, the Associated Students and a bunch of other political orgs when I was a student at UC Berkeley. Uh, and right toward the end of my senior year, I got bullied by my friends into running for city council. Um, I mean, really the, the arc here, 2014 was when the students successfully got this redistricting measure onto the ballot. It 
passed with flying colors. And so in 2014, they redrew the lines of the city council district. And that meant that 2018 was the first election that would actually use this new map. And people had been saying for years, ever since, since Nancy Skinner served on the city council uh, some time ago, she's our, our state senator today, she was a graduate student when she was on the Berkeley city council. People have been saying since that you know, it was overdue that we, we really institutionalized this, this young voice on the city council. And the redistricting effort was part of that years and really decades long campaign uh, that very much by accident, I sort of became a, an important piece of. So we announced our campaign in April, I think the, uh, the week before finals, my senior year, which um, that, that's, a, that's a certain sort of decision to make. I, I don't know, I, I wonder if running for city council is just a desperate ploy at procrastination in those last couple months. Um, but it, it worked out okay, so yeah, we won, and that was neat. Um, <laughs> organized this really ridiculous, you know, entirely student-run campaign. I mean, it was literally, it was just, it was my friends trying to put their guy, Rigel, in office. Um, it, it equal parts because they thought it was the important thing to do, the progressive thing to do, believed in the issues we were fighting for, believed I was the right choice among the candidates, um, but also I think because some of them thought it would be kind of funny. Um, and it, it was a splash, we get sworn in. Um, and I've been doing that ever since. You know, the elections that we're coming up on now, 2020, uh, we're halfway through the term and it has been a busy time. Uh, this is what our city council looks like when we used to meet in person. This is what we look like now. Um, and it has been such a journey, I'll tell you. Uh, so you, you may be wondering, you know, what does, what does a city council do? Uh, if you've watched Parks and Rec, you probably have, you know, at least some sense. Um, you know, I actually, I find that I, I can't watch the show anymore because it's, it's not, it's not as funny to me anymore now that I'm so immersed into it. It, it is what it is. Um, but you know, the, the role has a, has a lot of tones to it. Sometimes we get to do wholesome things like read the kids or serve food at soup kitchens or give people proclamations for doing nice things or hang out with firefighters or visit trash centers or uh, look at science or visit uh, you know, groundbreakings and uh, building topping off ceremonies and do panels <laughs> and hang out with the governor and whatever. Um, but that's-, that's... A really technical high school. Yeah. <laughs> uh, was it just say? Yeah. Um, but that's the easy part. So what I wanna skim on at some, at some high levels are, just a few of the biggest issues facing our city and how the city itself uh, responds to them every day. Um, as you all know, uh, you know, if you live in Berkeley, you spend any time in Berkeley, we have an acute homelessness crisis, uh, upwards of a thousand individuals uh, defined as homeless in Berkeley. And that can mean any number of things. I think that's really important for people to grasp. It doesn't always mean you're literally living in a tent on the sidewalk. Um, folks that are couch surfing, folks, folks that are living out of their cars, they are homeless too. If you are unhoused or not stably housed, you are homeless for all intents and purposes. And you know the potential to benefit in many ways from important city services. Hey, this is truly the defining crisis of our time here in Berkeley and really the, the Bay Area at large. One of the, the biggest sort of galvanizing moments of my first term around this entire issue was around the population of folks living in RVs in Berkeley, um, which became particularly politically charged maybe, a, God, I mean, now it was almost, almost two years ago, maybe a, a year and a half ago. By our best numbers, there are probably roughly, roughly 200 RVs that people are living out of uh, all over the city of Berkeley, many of them concentrated in West Berkeley by our best guesstimates, that easily means hundreds of people. Many of these RVs are holding families or, or small groups of folks that, that live together. Uh, it's a significant population living in, and really it's, it almost feels like the, the precipice of homelessness. You know, they are unhoused, they, they may not live in a home, but are sheltered in an important way. Um, and for so many people, I've, I've had a chance to, to talk to many of them, um, it was a very, conscious decision to go in on an RV when maybe they'd, they'd missed a month of rent, maybe even had enough money to pay the next month of rent, but knew that they were gonna be just out of luck after that. 
that made a, a calculated choice to knowing that they were soon going to lose their apartment. Uh, should they just keep paying rent on a place that they can no longer afford or go in on something mobile, something that could actually be theirs as sort of a, a Hail Mary, a last ditch attempt to still make sure that they have shelter no matter what happens. Um, yeah, it's a lot of folks and a lot of families, especially really living on the brink and, and many of them yeah, sending their kids to, to BUSD too. That's actually one of the most important tracking mechanisms we have for, for homeless families, you know, BUSD being able to, to identify folks that are, that are unhoused via the schools. Unfortunately, that creates a lot of tension in our, our neighborhoods too, though. You have a, a number of residents who you know, are very uncomfortable with uh, people living in vehicles on their street. So over the course of months and years, really, there was a, this growing sense and tension from many Berkeley residents riding into the city saying, we don't want these people living in RVs right outside my house. I don't want someone using the, the curb outside my front door uh, as their home. You know, that's the front of my house. It's my front lawn. Uh, they shouldn't be allowed to live there. And, uh, you know, all these in, in every direction, it's, um, you know, they're, they're legitimate, important sentiments. Uh, the folks in the RVs are just trying to find somewhere to live. Uh, and the folks living in their houses that don't want someone living in an RV right outside their house, I mean, that's not entirely unreasonable either. What this all really is, is the, the product of a housing crisis that's been allowed to foment for, for decades. Um, and there was a, a really tough vote um, that I was on the, the dissenting side of that the city made to prohibit people from sleeping in RVs on our city streets uh, overnight. But perhaps most interestingly, uh, maybe even just a week later, um, the avalanche of communications from, from regional leaders, you know, this, this council member in Emeryville, this council member in, in Oakland, coming together to say, you know, we, we understand why this happened, but you know, if we're gonna respond to the homelessness crisis, it needs to be more regional than that. We can't have one city pushing people out uh, without coordinating with other cities because then it just pushes the problem next door and becomes this ridiculous endless cycle of people just being punted around the East Bay with, with nowhere to land really. Um, right. so fortunately, uh, soon after uh, we were able to bring the item back to the council and pass sort of a more moderated iteration of it uh, to say we actually wouldn't enforce the ordinance at all uh, until we had a permitting system live to allow people to make sure that they were being uh, communicated to by our homeless services professionals, um, which has worked out much better. Um, but as is going to be a common thread in, in so many of these issues, you know, our next big project was to try to identify land in the city of Berkeley that we could open as a safe parking zone for RVs, much like they've done in, in Oakland at this parking lot right here next to the Coliseum. That is a project that was well underway, um, but basically has been frozen because of the COVID-19 pandemic as we've had to reallocate basically all of our staff time on every project that was ongoing to respond to the, uh, the immediate emergency at hand. That's all obviously connected to the, uh, to the housing crisis, um, which has spent, got you know, just, you know, housing and homelessness really come hand in hand. You can never shake the two from one another. Um, one of the most interesting and I think really galvanizing votes in my first year on council was a particular project that uh, at a location that you all may be relatively familiar with. This is the, um, the Walgreens right outside the BART station, uh, just a block up from Berkeley High. There is a proposal to build an apartment building uh, on that Walgreens. Um, it, it's actually a really interesting, really exciting project in a lot of ways. It would be one of the few very tall buildings permitted under our downtown plan. And because of its scale, the developers are required to donate upwards of $10 million to the city's affordable housing trust fund. That is the monies that we use to, to build new homeless housing, uh, to build new supportive housing, to finance projects like the, uh, the Berkeley Way project that just broke ground on Berkeley Way just a couple blocks from here. But what ended up happening was I think really one of the most bifurcated uh, city council meetings I've ever seen. Um, you had a massive population of you know, largely renters, um, many of them students, many of them students of color, uh, come to the city council meeting to say, you know, we really believe that we need more of this new housing in Berkeley. Um, we feel an acute housing shortage, uh, and it's critical to us that we 
you know, that we not be NIMBYs in our own downtown, that we make sure that we're creating opportunities for, for families and for, for tenants to, to live. Um, but what was controversial about it was that because of the scale of the building, part of the corner of the building would obstruct the view of the Golden Gate Bridge from the middle of campus, uh, a view that's, that's very storied, a view that's part of why the campus is where it is in the first place. Um, you know, the location of UC Berkeley you know, was decided at this, this point they call Founders Rock at the, uh, what's now the Northeast corner of campus. And it was because it was exactly across from the Golden Gates, you know, the, the landmass before there was a bridge there. Um, but they chose to, to put this institution of, of learning there. Um, it's a, you know, it's a, a storied view in so many ways. But to see all these young tenants, many of them students at UC Berkeley, coming to this meeting to say, this project is being opposed because it will obstruct a view from the middle of campus. We're the students at that campus. We walk by this view every single day, and we actually believe it's more important to us than the view that there be enough homes for the people that live here in this city in the middle of this housing crisis. Um, and again, you know, I think you know, much, like, much like the tension between RV dwellers and the, uh, the homeowners who are frustrated to have folks living right outside the door, um, you know, it's, it's all good sentiments on both sides. You know, folks that were worried that this, uh, this important spot, this important view in the city that's really part of our history um, would, be, would be impinged upon. Uh, and students worried that we, uh, we weren't making the, the decisions with the right foresight to make sure that we're actually uh, putting a dent in the housing crisis for, for years to come. Uh, but fortunately, we, we did approve the project uh, and that work, that work continues now. Um, and all of that, you know, all our work around housing, you know, really has to come in the, the context of you know, who, who Berkeley is and what our place is in the, the greater Bay Area housing discourse. Um, this is a map that some of you may be familiar with. It's a, it's a map of redlining in the East Bay. Um, that shows you where it was, you know, basically where it was, was legal to live, uh, depending on your race. You all may know the story to, uh, to Grove Street, uh, Grove Street being the red line in Berkeley, um, uphill of which you could not live if you were black or otherwise a person of color um, until some years ago. It was that street that was symbolically renamed uh, Martin Luther King Way. But today, even as redlining, even as uh, residential segregation is no longer legal in the strictest sense, yet many of the impacts of it still very much are. And so the city is now embarking on a really incredible journey to, to really try to undo the legacy of redlining, uh, to look at our zoning map today and think about how we make sure that every one of our neighborhoods has affordable homes in it for, for middle-income families, for low-income families, uh, and make sure that the segregation that was deliberately built into every city in the country is truly undone. And I think we have the, the political will to really take the lead on that here. Um, a big element of how we do that is missing middle housing. That means looking at your zoning map, uh, looking at the rules for what sort of construction is allowed in different parts of town, different parcels, and thinking about how you can loosen those rules to allow for more you know, affordable by design housing to be constructed. Part of that means making it more uh, you know, financially feasible for families to think about building an ADU in their backyard. They have a large yard that they want to build a little standalone unit in so a, a tenant or maybe even a, another family member or a, or a grandparent can live in. Right now it's very, very difficult to do that. There's been some, some really important state legislation to streamline that process, make it easier to actually and really, it's, it's a matter of having control over the property that you own. Um, but we have to go further than that, too. Um, so we're looking at uh, you know, possibilities to you know, really what, what so much of it is, is actually make legal once again so many of the, the construction styles that already exist in so many of our neighborhoods, but were built before zoning was a standard practice uh, in cities all over the country. Even in, in many of our our least dense, you know, single family neighborhoods in the city that you know, really in a lot of ways feel more like suburbs, uh, you'll often find you know, really lovely bungalow courts, townhouses, courtyards, quadplexes, uh, all over the place that were built there 
before the zoning map made it impossible to do so. Um, but we're really optimistic that uh, you know, with some, some really critical planning work here, we, could, we can make it a lot more possible for middle income families to live, even in the, uh, you know, the most otherwise unaffordable corners of the city, um, which is exciting. And we would be one of the first cities in the country to, to really tackle that head on, largely following uh, Minneapolis's lead. I realize I'm dragging on a little bit, maybe a couple minutes before four, and I wanna make sure we have plenty of time to look at any questions you have. So I'm gonna breeze over the rest of this real quick. Um, you all may have heard about, did you all hear about the, uh, the single use disposables item we passed maybe a year or two ago? I see a little nodding, gentle nodding, some head shaking, all good. You know, Berkeley, Berkeley has a really unique role to play um, for, the, for the whole country, really. You know, we are such, such a progressive enclave. Um, you know, it's, it's not uncommon, of course, in, in the Bay Area and you know, congressional districts like our own for a city council to be made entirely of Democrats. And that's very much the case in Berkeley. Um, but somehow, I mean, this place really just punches above its weight. And I, I think it's a reflection of an incredibly involved citizenry, really, that challenges our city to, you know, to, think, of, to think of things in new ways. And you know, sometimes I, you know, I think the, the natural result of that, you know, people will, will ridicule Berkeley for um, trying to fix things that aren't broken. Uh, and there, there's some truth to that. But what it usually really means is that we're looking at things, um, looking at the way that we've always looked at them, and asking ourselves, uh, it may not seem broken, but is there a way we could be doing it better? And for which reason Berkeley has been the first uh, to do so many things that, that we take for granted today. You know, Berkeley was the, the first city in the country to adopt curbside recycling. Now it's hard to imagine that not being a basic function of municipal government in every city in the country. Um, Berkeley was the first city to, uh, to adopt curb cuts uh, the little ramps between the curb and the street at intersections that make it possible for you know, folks in wheelchairs to, to have as much mobility and accessibility as, um, you, as, as I do. Um, that was an innovative novel thing that happened first at Telegraph and Durant and some years later became part of the ADA and is now required at every single intersection in the country. We're pulling things like that off all the time and that, you know, that legacy continues today. Um, I think it was only a month or so after I was elected that we passed <clears throat> this. It was the, uh, the single-use disposables ordinance, really the most ambitious single-use disposables law that had been passed anywhere in the country to really try to phase all of our dining industry in the city out of these, these massively you know, waste-generating practices uh, and to move I mean, really in two directions. One, to prioritizing reuse of cutlery and plates. Um, and secondly, for you know, when you are having takeout, um, to prioritize compostable materials uh, so that we're not contributing to this massive growth of our landfills uh, with our dining industry. Um, headlines about that, headlines about that. <laughs> it was such a beautiful meeting. And you know, I, I think something that I'm, I'm reminded of just so often is just how special it is that Berkeley City Council meetings can, can get as crowded as they do. Um, at almost every meeting, it really feels like there's something exciting on the agenda. Uh, and we had dozens, dozens, dozens of folks packed in this room, which, you know, of course, wouldn't be advisable today. Um, but to support this, uh, this ordinance, because it really, you know, while there was one council member, uh, council member Sophie Hahn, who represents District 5, who was the, the principal on the item, it really came about from the, from the community. It was folks like this, uh, this classroom, this uh, zero waste classroom at Oxford Elementary School that were campaigning for this, folks at the, uh, the Ecology Center that wanted to see it happen. Um, and that's, that's the story behind so many of the exciting things that, that Berkeley has pulled off. You know, the, the city council members may ultimately be the vehicle for the passage of an exciting piece of legislation, but it's almost always because of, because of who Berkeley is because of who the people in Berkeley are that any of the, these ideas come to the forefront in the first place. I would say similar things about uh, the natural gas ban that we just passed. Let me skim over that real gently. 
and briefly just touch a little on, um, yeah, that's sort of the, the arc of our, you know, much of our environmental work in the last year or two. And one of the next big projects we're looking at is a um, redesign of many of our commercial districts um, around pedestrian and bicycle options to, to really try to, yeah, if I, I've never been to Europe, but if you have, you know, to, to be inspired by some of the pedestrian plazas um, that really are so critical in the, the placemaking of these downtowns. Uh, and to imagine that, that Berkeley could really do that too, in part because it would be good for the businesses, but in part because it could actually incentivize us to, to get folks out of their car and try to live more car-free lifestyles in the, the densest parts of our town. Um, so there's a lot going on. But that was all before March. On every one of those prongs, um, a lot of the work has been frozen and for good reason. I mean, virtually every project that we were either partway through on or just starting on or had funded, but really hadn't even started to chip away at, um, you know, if it didn't have to do with our quartet of crises that we're dealing with now, uh, we froze it. Um, There's a, a process that we called budget deferrals. We built this laundry list out and it was, it was so painful because it was all, all good things. Um, but basically everything in the city budget we could find that you know, as much as we may want to do it right now, at the most fundamental level, did not, strictly speaking, have to happen this year. We put it in a folder and we called it budget deferrals, which means we deferred the funding that we would have spent on that, punted that to at the earliest next year, and are using that money instead to respond to the pandemic. Um, which, you know, I, I think in, in a lot of ways, you know, it's it's been painful, It's it's been tough, but... Uh, it has so clearly been worth it. Um, I mean, our, our numbers here in Berkeley are, we, we have a lot to be, to be really grateful for. Um, you know, if you were keeping up with what it felt like in New York City, you know, early April, mid-April especially, that never happened here. It still hasn't. There is still community spread. There's community transmission in our city. You know, we still get uh, a couple new cases basically every couple of days, um, but it has been mitigated because we we really did shut down um, and are doing everything we can to to stop the bleeding in the meantime. Um, so there's there's a lot going on. Uh, you know, really we we call it a quartet of crises. I should update this slide. I mean, it's really it's the pandemic, it's the wildfire risk. Uh, you know, these disasters don't talk to each other; they compound on each other. You know, the wildfires don't stop because we're dealing with something else right now. Um, pandemic, wildfire risk, this reinvigorated movement for racial justice, and a budget crisis and a financial crisis that is looming over the entire city. Uh, you know, if you know anything about how um, how, how cities are funded, uh, you know, it's it's all tax revenue, uh, most of which is generated by, you know, just to put it in the most simple terms, it's generated by people doing things. You know, you, you go outside and you, uh, you have a meal or you, you, buy, you buy anything at a store and there's a little tax on that uh, and that goes to your city or you're, you're doing your job. Um, there's, a, there's an income tax on that. You know, the more things people are doing, the more your cities receive. And under shelter in place, which we've done for obvious reasons for the, the public health benefit, people are literally doing less. And the revenues that we expect to get from so many of our taxes are just tanked. I and mean, we're looking at like a $40 million hole in our budget that we're trying to plug. Um, but that's, that's the impetus for all these, these budget referrals that have been floating around. Uh, I'm just going to breeze through the end of this to make sure we, again, have some time for questions. Um, as you can imagine, one of the biggest lifts here has been our relationship to the UC Berkeley campus. Uh, many campuses all over the country have entirely bungled their response to the, uh, to the pandemic. Um, you know, group living quarters, dormitories especially, are just by the nature of how they're built, um, you know, a, a festering ground for, for a virus that's transmitted, uh, for a respiratory virus. Um, there were obvious pitfalls that so many campuses uh, you know, fell into, but for the most part, you know, our, our city health departments and UC have communicated together so well and we you know again have not seen that spike in cases that we were really worried we would um our testing capacity has expanded greatly actually just this week we're reopening 
the curative pop-up sites that have been open at a, right off of San Pablo at the adult school. Um, that location is able to turn around tests at about, you know, I think, 24-hour turnaround time. I'm going to try again another one on, on Wednesday. I've gotten five negative tests now. We're, we're going strong. Perfect track record. Um, but we, we've done so much to make sure that it is as possible and easy for every resident that wants to, to be able to get tested as regularly as they can, um, which we're really lucky for. That's me getting a test. It's a great time. Um, also doing as much as we can to support our small businesses. Uh, this is a painful tweet that someone showed me a little ago about one of the, the, the little shops on, a, on Telegraph saying, if you're in Berkeley, please stop by Taco Sinaloa on Telegraph. They're making enough for rent, but not enough to pay their workers. So they might close down their tacos are bomb, which is true. If you're looking for a place to eat, check them out. Um, and what I, would, what I would say to you is that you really can substitute the words Taco Sinaloa right there for everything, every single small business that you know and love. Um, they're hanging on the edge and it's, it's painful. I mean, a lot of them have yeah. I guess, had to get used to uh, you know, expecting to make maybe 40% of the sales on a given day that they would have on the same day the year before. Um, we've seen a number of uh, really painful closures in all of our commercial districts. Um, we're able to pull together a really incredible Berkeley relief fund of several million dollars, but you know, when we opened up applications for these, these grants to small businesses, I, I, you can imagine, I mean, we were just swamped. I mean, we received so many applications that the, the grants that actually went out ended up being um, a really, I mean, so minuscule. There were so, you know, several thousands of dollars for, for every one of them, but every, it really felt like every single small business in the city reached out for help because that's what's happening right now. Yeah. Um, so we're, we're trying to get creative and, uh, you know, find new ways for, for you know, life as we knew it to exist safely under these new circumstances, um, but it's hard. What I'd touch on lastly is, of course, everything that's happened since the, uh, the murder of George Floyd. Berkeley has a, a really rich history of, you know, always trying to be on the, you know, on the front lines and the cutting edge of uh, police reform and racial justice work. Um, and that's been, that's been true for, for years. I think we actually may have had, if not the first, one of the first um, civilian review boards of our police department of any municipality in the country, the, uh, the Berkeley Police Review Commission. It became the model for similar sorts of bodies in, in cities all over the place. One element of the, the broader discussions around reimagining public safety that has really been a place Berkeley has honed into in particular, um, I mean, it's really two prongs, traffic enforcement and mental health and homeless responses. Um, and the big question here is, you know, what, what are the ways that we can design public safety whereby roles that right now everyone expects or everyone presumes will be carried out by an armed officer? Are there ways that we can achieve the same public safety goal without armed officers, without police officers? Um, which in, in so many levels, you know, you imagine could be, could be safer for the community. It could also be safer for the, the police department in many ways. It also might even be more cost effective. Uh, you know, staffing a PD is, is uh, you know, a particularly expensive venture. Uh, cities all over the country are, are looking at this question, if you've been tracking what's been happening in uh, Minneapolis especially, um, but it's, it's a challenge to do because eh? really none of this is precedented. We're, we're looking at really trying to create new and novel ways of achieving community safety in our city. Um, I'm really optimistic about what Berkeley is up to, but it, it's, a, it's a long arc and none of it is, is easy to crank out, especially given you know, really the, the trio of other crises I mentioned. Um, you know, with the, the financial crisis and the budget crisis being what it is, it's like it's simultaneously the best and the worst time to imagine a significant restructuring of how your city government works. You're looking at a $40 million hole in your budget. Things are precarious. And that creates the sort of the, the pressure cooker you need to imagine ways that things could be done differently. But also it, at a very real level, we're just trying to stay afloat. We're just trying to make sure that we're not laying off city employees, making sure that we're not significantly coming to furloughs and making sure that we're keeping the community safe right now uh, while the pandemic and smoke are in the air at the same time.